The young man in this home video is 23-year-old Will Tahini. Will is dancing with his mum at his brother's engagement party. But less than 48 hours after this video was taken, Will's life would change forever following an horrific road crash. A road crash he'd survive. I'm Ali Langdon and this is After Impact, a program which looks at the life-changing consequences of surviving a serious road crash. Statistics show that around 1,200 people die on Australian roads each year. And while many of us wouldn't deliberately choose to risk our lives this way, given the number of cars on the road, it appears to be a risk we're willing to take. But a car crash is not just a matter of whether you live or die. It's also a matter of what life might look like if you survive with potentially serious lifelong injuries. And while 1,200 annual road deaths is devastating enough, the number of people who survive a crash but sustain serious injuries is around 40,000 every year. Just let that sink in for a moment. 40,000 a year. And then ask yourself, what if I was one of them? I my brain for so long, I was in this coma for 38 days. I shattered my pelvis. I broke multiple vertebrae in my spine. 97 staples from ear to ear. Like, why can't this be fixed? Why can't I move? So I had no blood flow, essentially, to my left shoulder and arm. There was no pulse. I had a close head trauma resulting in an acquired brain injury, which is a permanent disability. It's still unclear if I'll be able to have kids or not. Um, it's absolutely every parent's worst nightmare. This car crash has affected my ability to earn a living for myself. I never saw this happening to me. We're about to meet seven road crash survivors whose lives are now drastically different than before. Each one is living with the long-term consequences of surviving a serious road crash. And they'll explain what that crash has cost them in terms of their physical, mental, financial, social and functional well-being. We'll also see how, despite the serious nature of their injuries, they've managed to turn their lives around. Eli had been a genuine contender for the Australian Olympic volleyball team. Like many young men his age, he thought he knew everything, thought he was bulletproof and wanted to live the life of a badass. He was just 24 when he took one risk too many. My reckless lifestyle certainly came to a head on May 19th, 2004, when I was showing off to my then girlfriend. She liked it when I drove fast. I was speeding, I was under the influence on the night. I took a bit too fast, lost control, and went head on in a couple of very solid pine trees. Holly was keen on outdoor sports, travelling and hanging with friends. She just started a new job when something beyond her control changed her life forever. When I was 22 years old in 2017, the 2nd of July, driving home from work in this exact place at this exact time, I was in a car crash that changed my life forever. As I rounded the bend on this road, I swerved for a kangaroo. I overcorrected and I hit the tree on my side of the car door, taking the full impact. Lockie's always been an animal lover. He was a qualified diesel mechanic who lived for his work and his rugby. He was just 21 when something unexpected happened. On the 11th October 2013, I was on the way home from work. The car in front of me all of a sudden swerved. And then there was a mattress in the road in front of me. I hit that, lost control of the car and shot off the left-hand side of the road. The car hit the concrete culvert that I'm sitting on right now. From there, the car rolled. I was ejected from the vehicle. John was a motorbike fanatic. He was in a newish relationship with a lady called Skye. And that came with the added responsibility of a stepdaughter. It was just two weeks before his 30th birthday when his traumatic accident happened. The date of the accident was the 25th of November, uh, 2015. I was asked to take the posty bike to the motor vehicle registry for inspection. The only helmet available was an open face helmet. I was um, looking at the speedo 
and the light had changed to red in the time that I was looking at the speedo and there was no time to slow down or stop. I hit the back of the car in front of me. I remember the noise, like the, the, the crunch noise of my face hitting the car. Blake is a lovable larrikin who loves the outdoors. He was right into things like rock climbing, camping and road trips. He was 21 and had just become a fully qualified electrician when something happened beyond his control. On the 1st of September 2017, at this exact spot, I was lying, drowning on my own blood. For no fault of my own, I was involved in a motorcycle accident where a drunk pedestrian made the choice to walk out in front of me as I made my way home. Unfortunately, as a result of this accident, he lost his life and mine was changed forever for the worse. Samara was about to start a new job in Darwin. The home she was building was nearly completed and she was totally devoted to her one-year-old puppy, Hazel. She was just 22 when she misjudged the distance between a truck and the car she was driving. On the 26th of September 2020, I was in a serious car accident just in the intersection behind me. I had my dog Hazel in the back seat and I was on my way to take her to the dog park which is just up the road. I was T-boned by a truck and pushed 40 metres up the road. And then there's Will, who we saw dancing with his mum at the start of the program. He was a FIFO worker who grew up on a farm and loved being on a boat, wakeboarding, fishing and diving. He was just 23 when his world imploded. June 14th. 2022, got a message from a mate asking if I want to go down to a pub to have lunch. So he picked me up in his car, we drove down there, had a pizza for lunch and a fair few drinks. And we'd organised for a ride home. And on the way home, we lost control coming around a corner. We went about 40 metres into the scrub. In a split second, each of these seven people had their world tipped upside down, changed forever. But not just their world. You see, after the initial impact, a road crash survivor who has serious injuries will affect the lives of so many people other than themselves. Our hearts actually sank because it really did tell us this wasn't just a a skid off the road or a, a scrape or something. And the, the police officer's tone with us was extremely gentle, uh, very, very quiet and, and please, saying, please, you need to go to the hospital now. I was given initially 5% chance of survival. I had a close head trauma resulting in an acquired brain injury, which is a permanent disability. When I first walked in, she was lifeless. They'd put her into an induced coma. She had the breathing tubes. You, you just, you go to sort of say hello to her and touch her, she was cold. And it was just, yeah, not a very nice feeling at all to see your daughter lying there helpless and knowing that you can't do anything to, to help her. I broke both my legs, my femur bones. I shattered my pelvis. I broke multiple vertebrae in my spine. I broke my right hip and tailbone and I had brain bleeds and shearing of the brain, leaving me with severe traumatic brain injury. It was bad. The car had rolled several times. Lockie had been ejected from the vehicle. He was lying face down on a culvert. I remember jumping out of the car and going across and lying on the ground. He was covered in dirt. He was critical. What happened to me was very serious. I was in this coma for 38 days. No blood supply for a long time, so I had a big blood infusion, that kind of stuff, and then from there, they've done some x-rays and they've seen that C4 and 5 my neck, I'm pretty sure it was, was shattered to a million pieces and T7 to 10 on my back were broken too. I had two rods and eight pins um, put in my spine as well. That was to help hold me together and put me back together again. Initially, when we got to the hospital, it's all playing on your mind what we're going to see. And then um, when we saw him, we go into the ICU, and he's on the table, and there's nothing going on. I mean, he's getting, he was getting help breathing or whatever, uh, and just, just a body. The doctor said to me, you're, you're 
bottom jaw's good and your forehead's good, but everything in the middle looks like a box of cornflakes. But I barely recognised him. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, he was just wrapped up. I just knew this, it was a bad accident. I suffered uh, multiple bleeds on the brain, severe bleeding to both my lungs. I dissected my subclavian artery, so I had no blood flow essentially to my left, left shoulder and arm. There was no pulse. The ne neurologist came in and said to us that he'd just permanently lost the use of his arm. And um, I just remember Blake sobbing because that's a big thing when you're 21 years old to be told you're never going to use your arm again. And significantly for Blake, it was his left arm and he's left-handed. It wasn't something that with rehab or, you know, treatment was going to get better. It was just, that's it, gone. I got the phone call to head down to the corner and I instantly, I was, it took my breath away. I didn't know what was going on. I could hear the panic in her dad's voice. I could hear the, the stress in his voice. And her dad actually said on the phone, I'm not sure she's still with us. She was unresponsive for about six minutes. It took the paramedics about an hour and a half to get me out of the car. Um, my dog Hazel, she also had nerve damage in her back leg as well. They told me in the hospital that I had fractured my pelvis in multiple places. I had a deflated lung, so they had to um, put a tube in my side um, to get all the rest of the liquid out of the area and reinflate my lung. I had a torn liver and then I also just had brain damage just from the knocking around um, of the accident. So I woke up in the Royal Adelaide in intensive care and they told me that I had dislocated C5, broken C6 and compressed my spinal cord. I probably didn't understand the severity of it straight away. But I knew it wasn't good because I couldn't move. And I'll never forget walking into the room where they led me to see Will on a bed just about to have an MRI. And his face was covered in blood. And just the whites of his eyes were looking at me. We said, I'm sorry, Mum. <laughs> and then we got to give him a hug tell him that we loved him <laughs> and he was off to have surgery and then they explained to us that his spinal cord had been compressed <laughs> and you never think that something like that was going to happen to your family <laughs> um, and the grief and the heartbreak and, and also the holding on to hope that he was going to survive that surgery will always be with us. Mm -hmm. I just remember thinking, like, why can't they fix me? Like, why can't this be fixed? Why can't I move? Like, looking at myself and trying to make myself move and nothing happening. I was nearly one of the first people after his family to go see him. And it was, it was sad, like. The last time I seen Will, walking, fishing and camping to what I seen him in a bloody wheelchair, not being able to do anything. His dad was feeding him. That was horrible. That was the worst thing I've ever seen. Still to come, we'll learn how each of our survivors managed their physical injuries and how they faced the mental and financial challenges. Welcome back. You're watching After Impact, a program which looks at the life-changing consequences of surviving a serious road crash. From his motorcycle accident, John suffered such severe injuries to his face that he required a full facial reconstruction. You can see a scar here and here. They cut me over the top of my head and uh, basically peeled my face off and start again. So I had 97 staples from ear to ear. It was horrible. On about the fourth or fifth day, I went in to see Eli and his hands had curled up in, like, in spasticity. 
And that was probably the day that I realised that my son was going to have a very difficult pathway ahead of him. At the rehab centre, I was basically a six foot six newborn child. I had to teach myself how to walk in. I had to teach myself how to talk in. Drinking, I had both my arms fused at one point because my muscles just didn't work. So I had to teach myself how to actually eat again. I had spoons that bent around the corner. At the moment, I can't get myself in and out of bed. I need a second person to help put a sling underneath me. And we use a ceiling hoist to lift me up out of the chair, over to the bed, and then back down on the bed. That's how I get in and out of bed every morning. When I was okay to leave hospital, they said that I'd be going to Hampstead Rehab. I went into the brain injury ward. I didn't understand. I thought my physical injuries far outweighed my head injury. I didn't really realise that I had a head injury. I didn't realise the impact of what I was dealing with. I couldn't really speak. I couldn't, I couldn't construct a sentence. I didn't really, I was so confused and lost at the time. There's a huge lack of understanding about brain injury. People think that if you look fine, you are fine, but that's just not the case. So it's everything from people having speech difficulties and, and, and someone thinking they're intoxicated to being abused when they get out of the car at a disability parking space. But behind the scenes, they've got really big challenges in their lives due to their brain injury. Behind the smile, Holly has, has struggled, you know, with cognitive challenges, with fatigue, with physical challenges. She's had to do so much work to rebuild her life, work that no one, no one would know just from looking at her and seeing her smiling face. Fatigue that comes with a brain injury is huge and it's so hard because it is invisible to explain and to, you know, not be perceived as lazy or ignoring someone. Yeah, the brain injury part of it's been really, really tricky, I suppose. To accept, probably the hardest part. Because I'm a, a young, fit man who should be able to work still and do everything that he did before, but... It's not a everyday occurrence for a lot of people to have to see their other half go through so many different therapies. Having to support him through the downtimes, the crashes, the... I guess what you'd say is like when things become overwhelming for him or when there's too much stuff happening. It's become very apparent to me that a quiet brain injury affects everything about you. Every part of your body is impacted. Your emotional intelligence loses about 20 years what it did for me. Following his accident, Blake was faced with a dilemma. What to do about a left arm that no longer worked was wasting away, causing him constant pain and just got in the way. Two years after his accident, he made the tough call to have his arm amputated. The decision wasn't easy, but I like to think I'm pretty logical. I said, if I can't fix it, I've got to do something to at least make it easier to live with. Your options are limited. I tried different slings, different ways to carry the arm. But at the end of the day, it was still just in the way. It wasted away, it was skin and bone before it got cut off towards the end. We had to relearn how to write. He had to relearn how to do, you know, just your day-to-day -day tasks because you, you, you take it for granted that you need to wash yourself, you just wash yourself. He had to make a complete switch in his brain, so there was a lot of pressure. So we've seen the physical injuries that can be caused by serious road trauma. But what about some of the hidden issues survivors face, like their mental health? The last few days in rehab, I started realising something wasn't right. That's when my brain started coming to and, you know, realising the impact that this crash has had on me. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't go to the shower. I couldn't stand. I, I couldn't talk. I couldn't do anything. And I remember my grandma coming into my room and I just started bawling. I just started crying hysterically, realising that this was my life. Like, I had to go to therapy, not just for my accident, but because of what my parents had to go through as well. And it's, 
like I, it was an accident and it, it could have it could have happened to anyone but like I didn't want to feel that like I've, I've put them in so much pain as well so when I found out that my dad was um, just two cars behind the truck and saw the impact saw it happen he was actually first on scene as well um, so when he got to the car and I wasn't waking up it would have been like a nightmare for him it was wasn't more towards the end of my time in ICU and as I moved into the surgical wards and I had a few more scans that I was a bit more conscious for that they started to explain the severity of the long-term injuries mostly the nerve damage and the implications that had being you know my arm was well and truly um, buggered that I, I started to get the real emotions and a bit of sadness a bit of anger. I think the other big thing um, was his medication as well. The medication obviously blew him up, but Blake being Blake researches everything. It slows down mental function over time. So he made the choice that he'd rather be smart and in pain than um, just kind of getting through life and just being out of pain, you know? So, and that's just such a typical Blake thing to do. Amanda Padden is a senior social worker with the trauma service based at Royal Darwin Hospital. Experience has taught her that the term serious injury is rarely understood. I think this is a massive area that does need more general public awareness um, because it's not just about going to hospital, going to rehab, going home, you're all good. We know that the implications roll on for years and it's mental, it's social, it's emotional, it's functional, it's life goals and aspirations that all get impacted. I, I struggled mentally more so than physically. Our eldest daughter would spend a week on, week off with us. She'd be with mum for a week and, and dad for a week. And when she came home to us for the first time, I still had a bandage across my nose and uh, obviously looked quite different. And she wouldn't look at me. And I, while I understood, it hurt. She screamed and ran away from him. Um, I don't think I'll ever forget her reaction. Um, it actually put me in tears, seeing her in tears. And it makes me wonder what sort of traumatic um, memory she probably still has of it. I know people who um, are young parents of young children and those relationships have changed. Children can become scared of the changes in their mother or their father and relationships break down and marriages break down and even though they've survived the medical journey and the injuries, their lives are changed forever and it doesn't have to be like that. I was 21 years of age, the world was at my feet, I'd just become a qualified diesel mechanic, run the rugby with my local club. Um, I was, remember sitting on the back of a ute before the Sevens game we were going to be playing after winning the Premiership with my other mates, just looking over the field going, how good is life? And then fast forward two months, three months later, I'm in Hampstead, pressing a buzzer, waiting for a nurse to come into the room, lift me out of bed, put me over into my electric wheelchair so I could drive down to breakfast. That was hard. The mental health impact is just one of the hidden costs of life as a road crash survivor dealing with serious injuries. Then we have the financial impact. In Australia, we're blessed with an excellent universal healthcare system. Yet serious road crashes can leave survivors and their families struggling to pay for a host of things including the ongoing care that's needed. The financial burden was one of the most stressful parts. I could, I could deal with the emotional side of things. I could deal with um, the, some of the physical changes. Some of those things I just couldn't help, but the financial stuff, I had a car loan, I had bills, I had things I had to pay for. As a parent, we were like, have we done the right thing encouraging her to buy a house to make this massive commitment? She has a mortgage repayment and she has no income. How is she going to long term be able to make this work? Is she going to be able to afford to go travelling? Can she buy that new car? Is she going to have a family? I had to go home to live with my parents 
because of their care, support, and financially I couldn't put a roof over, over my head. So I had physiotherapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, arriving at my parents' house f four days a week for 11 months. I had to have lessons for about a year to get my driver's license back. I think Eli's quite traditional in the sense that he sees it as his role to provide for our family. And the unfortunate thing for him is that he can't provide for our family because he can't work full time. He's um, tried to work part time, but he fatigues extremely quickly. And that's not just physical fatigue, that's cognitive fatigue. So that's heartbreaking for him that he is in a position where he feels financially like a burden on um, our family and on society in general. My brain injury, this car crash, has affected my ability to earn money, earn a living for myself. I, I can't work eight hour days anymore. It's terrifying because I don't know what my future holds with that, the financial hardship that comes from this car crash. The stress, like, um, you know, you can't plan for something like this. You can't budget to end up nearly dead and with that out of a job for, oh, I think about 15 months all up, I didn't work. You can't plan to change careers as a 21-year-old electrician. Coming up, we'll look at the social and functional costs of being a road crash survivor and find out what's being done to influence the next generation of drivers. Welcome back. I'm Ali Langdon and you're watching After Impact, a program which looks at the life-changing consequences and hidden costs of surviving a serious road crash. One of those hidden costs is the social cost. If you're young and single, will you still get to go out with your friends? Will you still be considered attractive enough for a romantic relationship? When his accident happened, John's immediate concern was whether his new partner, Skye, would still want to be with him. I knew I was a mess. And, uh, <laughs> although I badly wanted to see her, I was uh, a bit scared of what she would see, you know, so. You know, we hadn't been together long at that point. I didn't know whether she might just think this is too much and that'd be the end of it. I, 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 there was a lot of uncertainty and, and doubt in my mind. Serious injuries can affect everything and things like relationships and, and can I have sex with my partner anymore? Does my body, is my body still attractive to my partner? Is that relationship that I cultivated with that really special person gonna be the same anymore? A lot of the times it's not. Nothing worked below my shoulders, basically. So that included my penis, which was not ideal. So that was definitely a concern if that was ever gonna work again. Before the accident, it was, it was more of a, okay, I'm gonna have kids one day, but now it's like a, it's a lot more of a high risk pregnancy if I was to get pregnant because of my pelvis fractures that I've had previously. I couldn't go to that birthday that I clicked attending to on Facebook. I couldn't, I couldn't go out and socialise with friends. I was seeing on social media people going out and having fun and here's me needing two nurses to get me out of bed. I realised then that this was my reality now, this is my life. I have struggled quite a bit with my appearance. Uh, if I meet people for the first time, they can't really tell. But I look at myself every day, so I, I notice changes and I, you know, I notice there's a scar between my eyes and there are heavy bags under my eyes that weren't there before, but that's where the scar line is. I changed jobs because I, I didn't, you know, I don't have to deal with people so much now in this new role, but uh, I'm just not as outgoing as I used to be. For road crash survivors, being left with serious injuries often means having to find new ways of doing the things you once took for granted. It's what's known as the functional cost of road trauma. And it's something most of us would hope to never experience. Seeing the news reports of my car crash when I woke up out of my coma, saying that 22-year-old girl fighting for life 
You don't see anything about me after that. You don't see how my life has changed, what I have to live with and do to recover. That is, that is only a small second headline compared to what I have to go through to rebuild my life to the best I can. My life has completely changed. I didn't just survive in that car crash. My recovery probably will never stop um, until I suppose I want to stop. But then as soon as I start stopping, then I'll start depleting and becoming less able and have to start relying on more assisted aids for myself and other people all the time. Most people who do break their neck and break uh, their back, you know, fracture their, their vertebrae, will need lifelong support and care. As people age, uh, as people take on new things in life, their body changes. And so for Lockie, it's not as simple as fix the change. It's hands-on therapy to make sure that his body can function optimally to be able to continue doing what he loves and what he enjoys. From the moment that I had my car accident to pretty much where I am now to get back to full-time work again. It's taken almost three years to get to this point. I live in constant pain. The moment I wake up, the moment I go to sleep, it feels like my left hand's kind of getting electrocuted or on fire with the nerve pain. It's just, just how it is every morning and every night um, and every, every minute in between. My memory is very poor in the recall side of things. I've got um, different things for directing me how to do stuff like to make my oats or dal mixes, that kind of stuff, but sometimes I can forget how to put them in the right order or what to do first or second, that kind of stuff. Even now, a lot of my face is numb um, and it, it feels like I've been kicked in the face with a soccer ball uh, every day and it drives me bonkers sometimes. Um, so Eli's crush and the resulting disability has affected him in a way that there's not a minute of the day when it's not part of his life. So things like struggling even to get out of bed in the morning, getting dressed, things like that. Some days he's fine and other days he has very little independence. I will never be back to where I was before the crash. I certainly can't run. I have trouble walking at the end of the day. I still struggle with steps if there's no rail to hold on to. If we want to go out, there's never a time when we can do that in a spontaneous way because we have to plan, is there access? How close can we park? Um, will there be steps or uneven ground that he can't get across? Um, there's never a time when he's not living with the results of his choices. I decided to be part of this because before my accident, I used to just think of people with accidents, oh, they either die or they, they're they'll be right, but the number of people that are injured with life-changing injuries is way higher than you can even imagine. I would just ask people to, to just think a little bit, take that little bit of time beforehand to save a lifetime and then you can just get on doing with the things that everyone planned to do. And I think that, you know, this has happened to William and this has happened to our family and the impact has been insurmountable, you know, it, it can happen to you. Road safety statistics tell us there's an over-representation of young people in deaths, serious injuries and loss of licence. So what's being done? Well, across the country, there are numerous hands-on road safety programs being implemented in schools to try and reach young drivers especially those about to get their licence. But as Charlie Reid, a senior community engagement officer from Road Safety in the NT admits, there are some challenges. How do we engage with people who already, already think they know what everything about road safety? It's hard. I guess the one benefit we have is everyone's got skin in the game. Like this is an issue that affects everybody in our community. So the engagement in terms of that can be easy, but in terms of changing behaviours and improving attitudes can be, can be difficult, particularly in the long term. So today's presentation is about choices. Across the NT, the Choices program attempts to change attitudes and ultimately behaviours of school students by focusing on risk and consequences. We make choices every day. We make good choices and we make bad choices. The road safety team also do their best to reach Aboriginal school kids with strong messaging on simple but extremely important things like 
wearing a seatbelt. We try and focus a lot on seatbelts. Um, you know, Aboriginal people are overrepresented in our road stats compared to our population totals, so they, they are overrepresented. Um, and not wearing seatbelts is overrepresented as well across the cohort, but in Aboriginal fatalities. Um, so we want kids to wear seatbelts. The last thing we need to do is make sure it's just, just a little bit tight. Not super, 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 super tight so that we can't breathe and we're uncomfortable, and not super, super, super loose. All right, just, just a little bit tight. Then there's PARTY, which stands for Prevent Alcohol and Risk-Related Trauma in Youth. The program's coordinator, Belinda Nolan, is proud of its unique approach. I think what's good about the PARTY program is that um, we're bringing small groups um, of, you know, teenagers um, and we're taking them out of their school environment and bringing them into our environment and exposing them to what traumatic injuries can result from their risk-taking behaviour and having them speak with doctors and nurses and other allied health including paramedics around what it is like for us uh, looking after these trauma patients every day. One of the activities that we get them to do during the day that they do get a lot out of is the drunk buster goggles. Do you think you'd be safe to drive a car? No. Can you see? <laughs> a little bit. Do you want to see if you can throw a ball in the... Can you see the basket? Oh! <laughs> so we do have an array of goggles that mimic drug, alcohol, uh, intoxication. And so we get them to wear these and have a go at a whole different ranges of alcohol intoxication uh, and do activities. When it comes to our rehabilitation activities, you know, getting them to just wear like a spinal collar on their neck for 40 minutes and having one arm restrained that they can't use throughout that session and just try to do, you know, what we think is simple, you know, activities of daily living. And they just have to do that for, you know, 40 minutes and then getting them to think that, you know, some people have to do this for, you know, weeks to months or for the rest of their life, they're limited. I didn't realise that all the goggles, like the drugs that they were imitating could actually alter the way that you see things that much. Mm. But it was very difficult to try and drive with them on. Living with serious injury for the rest of my life, maybe not out of my recklessness, but someone else's, yes, it frightens me to death. One, because my family will have to see me in that condition. They've seen me in a better condition and just for them to automatically switch to me in a wheelchair or um, just can't even formulate a sentence, nonetheless go to the bathroom, it's, it's really hard for them. We definitely don't think about brain injury and then just seeing that it's quite confronting and it really opens your eyes, I believe. Um, you know, it's not something that everyone sees just every day, but being able to see it is really cool and it's a really good learning opportunity for us. And there's Street Smart High, an annual event that has brought together thousands of senior students, incorporating a major crash scene simulation with stories from people who have been impacted by serious road trauma. Across all of these initiatives, there's one clear goal, to change attitudes towards road safety through education and personal stories. Still to come, our road crash survivors talk about what they've lost from their lives, but also how they've turned their lives around and, where possible, are now using their own experience to help others. Welcome back to After Impact. What happens to survivors of serious road crashes who are left with life-changing injuries? We'll never fully understand the hidden costs of road trauma, the physical, mental, financial, social and functional costs. What we do know is they can last a lifetime. Serious injuries affect everything in your life, really quickly and, and really severely and for a really long time. They affect physically how, how, you, you know, how you do things and how you operate. They affect speech, they affect how you think, they affect relationships, they affect your emotions, your, your wallet, bottom dollar, can I afford to live at the moment and, and how, what does my life look like? You know, does my life, does my car need to be different now? Can I drive anymore? Can I have that job that I worked so hard to get or, you know, was so good at? Does that look the same for me? Does that look the same for my family? The thing I most miss would be, I guess, my life. It kind of feels like I never grew up, like I was this 21 year old fella from Humdidoo, 
playing sport, qualified diesel mechanic, about to travel the world, and it just never happened. So it's hard to quantify the things I've lost from my life. It's the little things that really impact you on that daily basis. Tying your shoelaces, cutting a steak, cooking, opening things. A lot of physical activities require those two hands. There's no way to think about it until you have to try to do it for the first time with one hand. And that's when you're like, oh, this sucks. There's a few things I can't do anymore. Um, so, like, the, if I wanted to get a particular job, I have to make sure that it's not a constant standing job. Otherwise, I'll get, like, reoccurring pain um, in my lower back again. Um, yeah, you know, like, my, my dog, she's, she's got a permanent um, leg injury as well. So she, when she gets super excited, she can't, like, jump around anymore like she used to. I have lost so much from this crash. I, I can't run, I can't jump, I, start, I can't stand for long periods of time. I used to be sporty. I used to love water skiing, snowboarding, and I can't do any of that now. That, that sucks. The world that Eli went into with doctors, hospitals, ongoing therapy, because it's still going, rehabilitation never stop, never ever stops. And it's a world that no parent wants to go into but all parents should know a little bit about and talk to their kids about how it can impact not just you but everyone around you. I was six foot strong as and now I can't even get myself out of bed. I can't go to the toilet. I have to use a catheter. I never saw this happening to me. Everybody gets to choose to take risks, but nobody gets to choose the consequences. I didn't understand that at the time. Jails and cemeteries are full of people who lived like I did, drove like I did. So if the worst I have to deal with is a quarter of his limp, slurred speech at times, well, it's not the worst thing that could happen. Throughout this program, we've certainly witnessed some confronting moments. But if there's an upside to the pain and suffering each of our survivors is facing, it's that all seven have been able to move forward significantly with their lives. Having experienced a terrible life-changing event, each of them, where possible, is now trying to use their story to help create positive change. When we spoke to Will, it was almost a year to the day after his accident. Will has risen to the significant challenges he faces. He's grown in confidence with using his wheelchair and has re-skilled himself in things such as using a mobile phone. His tight-knit family keeps him moving forward, which he thrives on. While he really misses life on the family farm and also his job as a FIFO worker, He's now become involved in wheelchair rugby. So while I was in the spinal rehab unit, I was introduced to another person in a wheelchair and he told me about wheelchair rugby and the next week they got me in a chair and I've been playing it ever since. And it's just great to get amongst other people with similar sort of injuries you learn so much more. It will help the function that he has um, and then there's just the fact of getting out and, and getting back into a community and, and interacting with other people so yeah it's been huge. Almost three years to the day after her accident Samara went back to full-time work as an event manager and is currently working towards a diploma in events. She now lives in her own home, which was finally completed after significant delays due to her accident. Hazel is still a huge part of her life, and the two of them are often seen at their local park. During her rehab, Samara shared her story with NT school students. I told them about my accident and how, you know, it's a split second and everything changed. I just wanted them to make sure that they were aware and safe on the roads, um, you know, because accidents happen. I wasn't texting on my phone, I wasn't drunk, I wasn't on drugs, none of that stuff. Like, I would never put my Hazel in danger 
or I would never hurt her in any way but sometimes it's just like out of our control of what happens and I just wanted to get across to them that you know driving is a privilege not a right to be on these roads so you just need to be aware of your surroundings and drive to the conditions and and be safe. Anyone who's just met her probably doesn't even realise how serious an accident that she's been in. Those of us who knew her before the accident have noticed the difference. Ultimately, she's still Samara. She's still fun, happy-go-lucky. She's so determined. She's such a hard worker. We're so proud with everything that she's achieved and everything she's going to continue to achieve. Blake's been getting his life back on track. These days, he works for the NT government, since a one-armed sparky is not a highly sought-after profession. He hasn't stopped being a lovable larrikin. He's still good mates with his motorcycle, even though he can no longer ride it. Instead, he drives a vehicle that's been modified to allow for the loss of his arm. He wants students and young drivers to understand what living with serious injury means and freely gives his time to that cause. Just looking at me, I want you to consider how things could have ended up so differently. If I'd been speeding, not wearing my protective gear or doing the wrong thing, what this situation I experienced could have been much worse. After having weight and occasional mental health issues, a mate suggested he take up Muay Thai kickboxing to help with his physical and mental outlook. For the last two and a half years, I've uh, been doing it weekly, even, even went to Thailand for two months to train. Um, no, no ambitions, no goals, but it's just, it's something I love. Yeah, his confidence has built up so much. We treat him no different to anyone. He's training in a fighter's class, it's pretty hard, and especially when you're doing sparring and that. Like, uh, they, don't, they don't take it easy on him. The biggest thing having Blake on the gym, it's unreal. Like I tell him all the time that he makes all these fighters become humble because they look at him and if he can do something, then you better do it because you got two hands and legs, he doesn't and he's doing it, so. John fights his mental demons and body image issues every day, as well as the physical scars and ongoing pain from his accident. He works full-time in the insurance industry and in 2023 was named the Underwriter of the Year for the NT. Despite what happened to him, he still loves riding motorcycles. John's built a loving family environment with his wife Skye and takes immense pride in bringing up their daughters. I'm a lot more emotional than I used to be. You know, I think I, I really appreciate small moments in life and, uh, you know, some, sometimes I get emotional thinking about what Sky's life would look like if, if, I, if I wasn't here, you know. Yeah, I would have missed out on a lot. You definitely learn to appreciate the little things in life. Um, you know, I never leave John without telling him I love him. Not that I wish that I won't see him again, but because it is possible. Um, you've got to make the most of what you have in your moment. John isn't just a statistic, right? He's, he's been made. I've seen what he's had to go through. I just hope that you know, no one else <laughs> would go through that or have to go through that. For Lockie, his acquired brain injury and other physical injuries have not held him back from remaining active. He does presentations to prisons, sporting clubs and students to encourage people to look after their mates when they're on the road. On the night of the crash, I was wearing my seatbelt, I wasn't under the influence of drugs and alcohol, and I wasn't speeding. The person towing the boat, he insecurely tied the mattress down, that's the risk he chose to take, and I'm left to live with the consequences. He's also a mentor at Brain Injury South Australia. To help with his poor memory caused by brain injury, he's taken up photography, especially around his prized fruit and veggie garden and at live music gigs. Lockie and his partner Jess also share their lives with Digger and Freddie, two rescue dogs from a shelter. Yeah, I can't believe the things I've seen him have to go through and the strength he's had to find and the ways in which he's grown and it's made me cherish life because I'm proud of the way that he helps other people see the world and the way he spends time with each person, you know, in a way that shows them that they mean something to him. He does that with every person he meets. That's such a beautiful thing. 
Holly's acquired brain injury and painful body injuries have become driving forces in her life. She's finally getting to do some of the travel she missed out on in her early 20s and has her boyfriend Nick to enjoy the ride with. She currently works on a casual basis in REPAT at the Brain Injury Ward and also for Brain Injury South Australia. Wherever possible, Holly talks to students and young drivers to help them understand how a serious injury can impact for life. Imagine waking up in a hospital bed to your body being completely broken. Imagine being in a brain injury ward at the age of 22. She's helped hundreds of people. Like she's gone to schools. She talks in front of lots of people, thousands of people at a time. Um, she's amazing. Like she's really, really good at what she does. And she's an inspiration to everyone and me. Like I want to do better as well on the roads after hearing what's happened to her. If I can get through just to one of you today, how serious and how quickly your life can change being in a car crash, that is all I want. Eli has now been living with his serious brain and body injuries for some 20 years. He talks to young drivers and school students in classrooms and at major events as often as possible. But it's an actual miracle that I didn't kill my girlfriend at the time who is sitting in the, in the passenger seat. This is made more powerful by the fact that he takes 100% ownership of the crash he caused. I can remember sitting just saying to him one day, how, how are you doing with all this? And he just quietly said to me, well, it's my fault, I got myself here. Eli's wife, Ali, has helped bring new purpose to his life and their dog, Henry, gets him out and about every day. He's also taking singing lessons to help raise money for the Get Home Safe Foundation. Roll, 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 got it, if you're in my soul, all right. There's a tremendous responsibility that comes with driving any vehicle. That responsibility extends to keeping ourselves and others safe on our roads. Regardless of who's at fault, serious road crashes can result in people being killed. They can also result in people having to live with lifelong and life-changing injuries, as 40,000 Australians will attest to each year. And that's not to mention the impact on those around them. I hope this program and the stories from our road crash survivors has caused you to think about your choices on the road and the consequences and the hidden costs of serious road crashes after impact. I'm Ali Langdon. Thank you for joining me for this special program. We'll leave you now with this uplifting story from Will and his parents, John and Louise. I think it was about two months after my injury. I was having a bit of a down day and I remember Dad asking what was wrong. The thing he really wanted to do was give us a hug. And it's a simple thing that you just take for granted. So I got my left arm up over my dad's shoulder and then he held my right arm and lifted it up and put it over his back in a hug. I walked in after John had been hugged and he said, Mum, I've got a surprise. And he, he struggled and he got both arms around me. And it's just heartwarming. Just never forget. Really focusing on those, the simplest things in life. The thing is, um, is enormous in your life. There's quite a few tears from everyone that day. <laughs>